It's our heart's desire that you would have your way in us, that you would work in us, Lord. Fill us fresh with your spirit. Give us your mind as we get into your word this morning. Would you speak in a powerful way to us, your church? And Lord, as we hear from you, I pray that we would be changed, that we would leave this place changed. So go before us this morning, God. We love you. We commit ourselves to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, it is good for you to be here this morning. It's very good for you to be here. It feels so nice, doesn't it, to be out on the property? It feels so nice to be on the... It's nice and sunny. It's not muddy. Oh, man. It's been like a month since I've seen some of you. Phil, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's good to be seen. <laughs> yes, it is. I mean, wow. I am so excited going through the book of Daniel with you guys this morning. And I, I just wanted to start with start and ask this question. I want you to think about this for a second. How many of you, of us, really, here this morning, we see all these things going on in our country. We see all these things going on around the world. How many of us have been or are currently anxious or wondering about the future, especially about the future of our country? Maybe you just maybe a little wondering, like, what's going on? What's going on? Maybe a little anxiety is coming in. What's going on around the world? And I, I think it's interesting because as we see this uncertainty, we, we see that there's uncertainty happening all around us. And as Christians, it's so important. We have to think clearly about the things that we see going on around us. And not only think clearly, we have to think biblically about what we see going on around us. And so we have to ask the question. These are the, there's two questions that I'd like you guys to ponder this morning. And we're going to answer both of them today. The first one is this. What does the Bible say about the future of this planet? Does the Bible say anything about the future of this planet? We know, we already know the answer is yes. And we're going to get into it today. We're in Daniel chapter two. We're going to get into it today. But here's the the next question. If, If the Bible is talking about the future of this planet, a future of our country even, the question I want you guys to think, and I want you to, to write something down on your paper. You have your paper? Everybody got a paper? You got a pen? Grab a pen, grab a pencil. I want you to write something down. I want you to think about this. What is the greatest issue? What is the number one issue facing America and, and perhaps the world today? Right now, today, Sunday, February 7th, what is the number one issue facing our country today? What is it? Now, don't, don't, don't stand out loud. We're going to answer the question at the end of the service. But I want you to think about this. Maybe write, write something a little something down. What is that number one issue that we are... We're facing a lot of issues. So it would be beneficial for us to know what the number one issue is. Because if we could handle the number one issue, then a lot of other things would start to fall into place. But what is that number one issue? If we can't agree on what the number one issue is, well, we're going to be in trouble. For those of you that were at the Wednesday Night Bible Study or watching it online, you already know the answer to this question. I gave those guys a sneak peek there on Wednesday night. Well, here in Daniel 2, Daniel 2, we are given the key. We are given the key to the end time so that we will not be surprised and we will not be troubled by the things that happen as they go on around the world. And we can walk in absolute confidence in God, knowing that he is in control and his plan is absolutely going to happen. He is faithful to his word. He's going to keep his word. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me. Daniel chapter 2. We are right here in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Verse 24 of Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. It says this. Therefore, Daniel had been praying. Daniel had Daniel and his friends had been praying. The Lord had answered their prayer. They know the dream. They know the interpretation. They gave praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. And now, therefore... Daniel went to Erech, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Erech brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? 
King Nebuchadnezzar wants to know if Daniel, the God Daniel serves, and can do what the rest of his counselors could not do. Does the God Daniel serves reveal himself to men? Does God reveal himself to men? This is really what King Nebuchadnezzar is asking. And so how does Daniel respond? I love how Daniel responds. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise man, no enchanter, no magician, no astrologer can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. It's impossible. Nobody can know what the king dreamed. And notice the next word in verse 28. But there is a God in heaven. I, no one on earth can reveal to the king what you have what you have dreamed on your bed. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. I love what McGee says. McGee says, Daniel immediately makes a distinction between the wisdom of Babylon, which is really the wisdom of the world, and the wisdom of God. There is an immediate distinction, Daniel says. There's wisdom in the world. They have their wisdom with all these enchanters and magicians and wise men and astrologers. They're out there. There's the wisdom of the world, but it cannot hold a candle to the wisdom of God. There is an absolute distinction between this wisdom of the world, which is really just foolishness, and the wisdom of God, which is absolute truth. The world cannot know what God knows. The world cannot predict what God can predict because God is in control of the entire universe. God is in absolute control and his plan will happen in his timing. And here, God knows the king's dream. God knows the interpretation of the king's dream. Why? Because God gave it to the king. God gives this dream to the king and therefore he knows the dream and he knows the interpretation and so he gives it to Daniel. Notice what Daniel says. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of of your mind. Just see what Daniel's telling this guy. Daniel's telling the king, you were wondering, King Nebuchadnezzar, as you went to bed one night, you were wondering as you went to bed, what would become of Babylon? What was going to happen to this nation? What was going to happen when you were gone? What would be after this? And God answers specifically what will happen to Babylon. And more than that, God goes beyond the thoughts that were in King Nebuchadnezzar's head and goes on and reveals the entirety of human civilization. And not only that, but he gives the interpretation through Daniel so that the king would know and all of us could understand what the Lord is doing. That God is in absolute control. And as we get into this dream that the king dreamed, we have the benefit of the interpretation. I mean, you guys have this little chart. It's in your bulletin. Go ahead. Make sure you have that because we're going to need it. We have, we have the interpretation. We have the benefit of the interpretation of the king's dream. We know what it means. But imagine for a moment. Imagine. Put yourself back in King Nebuchadnezzar's shoes. You've gone from a small city nation, Babylon. Military conquests begin to happen. You start overthrowing governments and kingdoms. And you go from this small nation to conquering, really, the majority of the known world. And there you are. You, you're a mighty empire. And you begin to wonder, what's going to happen to this mighty empire? What's going to happen to this empire, this Babylonian empire? What's going to happen? Just like, I think it's interesting, Nebuchadnezzar's wondering this. And just like us, we wonder. What's going to happen to the United States? What's going to happen to the countries, the kingdoms of this world? What's going to happen? And as Christians, guys, it's hard for us to even ask that question. Nebuchadnezzar did not know the answer when he asked the question. As he's lying there on his bed, he had no idea what was going to happen to Babylon. He had no idea what was going to happen in the, in the end times. And we here, we ask the same, what's going to happen to America? What's going to happen to our country? What's going to happen as we get closer and closer to the end times? We have the benefit. We have the knowledge of the template of what's going to happen in the end times. There was no way for Nebuchadnezzar to know, but we know. 
We know what's going to happen. And I think it's absolutely interesting because here Nebuchadnezzar's wondering and the Lord answers this pagan king. And here as Christians, we know what's going to happen in these latter days. And so look at this vision that the king has as he dreams on his bed. You saw, O king, look at the wording and behold a great image. It was a magnificent image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. I mean, just imagine, you're just, I wonder what's going to happen to the United States. I wonder what's going to happen to Babylon. Ah, who knows? And you fall asleep, and all of a sudden you're dreaming, and there's this image that appears out of nowhere right in front of you, this massive image, bright, terrifying, shining before you, and you're just freaking out, like, what is going on? I don't really remember my dreams. There's some people that remember their dreams. I, I don't, I'm not one of those people. I never remember what I dream. There's some people that they have these vivid dreams and they remember their dreams. I'm like, okay, that's good. But here, Nebuchadnezzar, he's having a dream that he never dreamed before. He's saying that this is an experience that I've never experienced before. The head of this image was of fine gold and its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And as you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Put yourself in King Nebuchadnezzar's shoes. He's sitting there having this dream, probably waking up, just sweating everywhere, and he's saying, what in the world did I just dream? What was that image? It's gold and silver and bronze and iron and clay. What in the world is this image? What was? What does it represent? What is this stone that's cut out not even by human hands and it rolls down and it breaks this image into pieces? What can be that powerful? And it's just a little stone and then all of a sudden it's growing and it consumes the entire earth. What is happening here? And now we get a picture into Nebuchadnezzar's mind. We can see why Nebuchadnezzar would begin to question his counselors and his gods saying I've never seen a counselor have a dream like this I've never seen the gods that I serve give a dream like this I need to test my counselors because I don't want just some any old explanation for this dream because if I told you that dream you could come up with 72 different explanations for that dream if you were a wise man in Babylon King Nebuchadnezzar didn't want to be fooled. He understood that this dream is significant, and it absolutely is. This dream is absolutely significant, and he needs he needs the correct interpretation because this dream is the key to understanding all biblical prophecy of the end times. This is the absolute template for biblical prophecy. And so God gives the interpretation to Daniel. And Daniel gives the interpretation to the king. And by giving it to the king, remember, this is all written in Aramaic. And so it's written in the common language for the individuals of the kingdoms to understand what will happen in the end times. So if you have that chart, we're going to get into this interpretation. of If you... (laughs) If you ordered that book, Charting the End Times, you're going to see that book a couple of times as we go through Daniel. This is from the book, Charting the End Times. I've got some more coming in. They're $25 for that book. If you want one, talk to Lorena. Make sure she knows, and she'll put you down for a book. But it's the book that Pastor Rick always used because the charts are just so absolutely incredible, just showing us what does the Bible say about the end times. And here, what we have is the key to understanding the entirety of the end times. This is what it is. Verse 36, this was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you. And yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom strong as iron because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. 
And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom. But some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with soft clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Church, right here, from verse 36 to verse 45, we have the overview of history. You have, you're, you're, we just read, the overview of history from God's point of view. From the time of Babylonian till the time of his return and into the millennial kingdom, we have the overview, the template of history according to God's view. This is God's view of what's going to happen in history. You're, you just read it. That's what's going to happen. I mean, Daniel 7, when we get into it, Daniel 7 is going to give us some more detail of this history of the world. But right here, we're holding the key to understanding history. We have, I mean, where are we in history according to this vision that King Nebuchadnezzar saw. Where are we in history? And another question we have to, we need, we need to understand what's going to happen in the end times. Notice the progression. You have your, you have your chart. Notice the progression. What is the head? It says it right there. It's gold. It's the Babylonian empire, King Nebuchadnezzar. Did that happen in history? Yes. There's no arguing that King Nebuchadnezzar was there, a king of Babylon, that Babylon was, uh, was a great kingdom, and that there it was. Babylonian Empire, 612 B.C. all the way to 538 B.C. What comes after the Babylonian Empire? Medes and, the Medes and Persian Empire comes after the Babylonian Empire, right? The, the chest and arms of silver. Inferior kingdom to the Babylonian kingdom. Chest and arms of silver. Did the Medes and Persians, did that happen in history? Yes. There's no doubt that that ha- We're going to read about it in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to read about the Medes and the Persian Empire. And after the Medes and Persians, who conquers them? Do you guys remember? You see, yeah, right. It's, it's the Greek Empire, Alexander the Great. The, the Empire of Bronze comes and conquers the known world. And there he is, Alexander the Great. And then Alexander the Great dies, and there's all this stuff that goes on. And after the Greek Empire, the next empire, the fourth kingdom, the, the, the feet, the legs of iron, the Roman Empire. Did, was the Roman Empire, did, has that happened in history? Yeah the Roman Empire has had. All of these things, church, all of these things have, are there a historical fact? The reason why the, the, the world out there hates the book of Daniel is because the book of Daniel prophesied very precisely about all of these things before they happened. The world outside says it's impossible for somebody to know all these things. Therefore, this book is a forgery. It was written after these events had already taken place, which is absolutely not true. This book was written well before any of these events took place. And so here we have this template. We've seen the gold. We've seen the silver. We've seen the bronze. We've seen the beginning of iron. And what haven't we seen? We haven't seen the iron mixed with clay, the little toes. What does it say? There's toes there. And it says in those in the days of those kings, there's going to be a plural of leadership. In the days of those ten kings that we're going to see, in Daniel chapter 7, there's going to be ten kings that arise. Have we seen these ten kings arise yet? And what are the ten kings going to do? They're going to give their power to one. They're going to give their authority to one. So you have these ten kings. We haven't seen them yet. They're going to give their authority to one. And who is the one? You guys all know. The Antichrist. The Antichrist. It's, written, it's right there on the bottom of those, those ten toes, that tribulation time. And in the time of the tribulation, at the, the Antichrist is going to come on the scene, right? The final Antichrist goes into the tribulation, and the tribulation culminates with what? The second coming of Christ. And when the second coming of Christ happens, he brings and establishes his kingdom. We call it the millennial kingdom. He reigns for a thousand years, the kingdom of heaven, here on earth for a thousand years. 
the destruction of all earthly governments happens. At the, at the end of the tribulation, the destruction of all human governments, the setting up of the millennial kingdom. Man, Jesus, church, <laughs> the time is short. We're living in the last, all that's, all that's left is for us to look for 10 kings. And the reality of it is that we might not even be here to see the 10 kings because they're only reigning for a very short time. There's no other, there's no other signs. I mean, you go, go read Matthew chapter 24. Go, go look at what are the signs of Christ's return. The signs happen in nature. This, go, go look at, uh, Second Timothy. It talks about the signs of the end times that people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money and power, disobedient to parents. You can go read the list of the signs of the end times. And here in Daniel, God says, here is the ultimate sign of the end times. You're going to see all these kingdoms happen, the ultimate sign of which is going to be ten kings that are going to therefore give their authority to one. And this is the absolute sign that the end is upon you. This is the sign. There's one thing to be looking for, ten kings. But we know, man, I hope I don't even see those ten kings. I hope I get raptured before that even occurs. But there's only one sign that we should be looking for. It's the ten kings. We see everything else happening in nature. We see the things that Paul talked about to Timothy. We see all those things happening. We understand. We can read the signs of the world. And we understand that we're very close to the end of this age. All that's left is for the the prophecy that God has set up here with Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel to absolutely happen. And so, I mean, knowing what the Bible says, you you have the template for human government, for what's going to happen in human government, knowing what the Bible says, what do we learn? I'm going to put before you that we learn two things, and they're two absolutely very important things about what the Bible says about the future. First, God has a plan. You look at this image. You look at the interpretation of the image. What can you say? You can look at that and say, does God know what's going on? God knew the Babylonian Empire. God knew the Medes and the Persians. God knew the Greeks. God knew the Romans. God knew exactly what's going to happen. He has an absolute plan for what's going on in our world even today. His plan, I mean, you just look at it. Realistically, God's plan happened. You could say that. Why? Because we saw history, the Babylonian kingdom. We saw history, the Medes and the Persians. We saw history, the Greeks. We saw history, the Romans. God's plan happened. We can also say, because God's plan happened, God's plan is also currently happening. God's plan right now is happening. The world is moving towards a one world government. You guys, we'll get that in a second. I'm getting ahead of myself. The world is moving. God's plan is happening right now. The world is moving towards a one world government. And if we see that happening right now, we can have absolute confidence that God's plan will come about to completion. That we will see ten kings. That we will see ten world leaders that give their authority to one. We will see an antichrist come on the scene. We might not see it here on earth, and I hope we do not. I hope I see it from heaven. That's my hope. But there's people here on earth that are going to see it. They're going to see these things happening. God's plan will be completed according to his design. So church, what can we take from that? Be encouraged. Church, be encouraged this morning. If you are an authentic Christian, then your leader is God. That's the person that you serve. Your leader is God. And your citizenship is where? Your citizenship is heaven. That rock, that little stone that rolled down the mountains, that shattered every single government on the planet. That's your kingdom. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. God is in absolute control. You are citizens of heaven. And our king is God. And we can therefore say, like the heroes of the faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 through 16, what does it say? It says, and this could be true of all of us. These all died in faith. The the reality is very simple for me. Either I'm going to die or I'm going to be raptured. I would prefer to be raptured, but I don't know that that's what's going to happen. But these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. 
but as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Church, you're part of the kingdom of heaven. This is where you you are citizens of heaven, the kingdom of God. I mean, don't lose sight of the fact of who you belong to and where you are going, where your citizenship actually lies. We get deceived into believing that our citizenship is actually of this world. It is not. We're citizens when we've been transformed by the blood of Jesus. Our citizenship is heaven. And it's so important that we remember that, that God has a plan and his plan is happening. And the second thing that we learn is a very important lesson. We learn something very clearly that humanity, there's people all around us, the world in fact, believes. There's a belief that goes on in the world all around us and it is this, that our forms of government are only improving. Our forms of government throughout history are getting better and better and better and better. This is what humanity outside believes that our forms of government are just improving and getting better and better and better. We believe that we are great as America. I'm speaking of America. We believe that we are great as Americans because of our form of government. And if we could only bring democracy and capitalism to other parts of the world, man, so many problems would be solved if they would just turn to democracy and capitalism. Don't we see that in our country today? If Venezuela would only become a democracy and only embrace capitalism, all of their issues would be solved. If Iraq would only embrace democracy and and embrace capitalism, all of their issues would be solved. Do we not see this going on in our foreign policy today in our country? We actually believe that government is getting better and better. This is what humanity believes. Our government is getting better and better. I mean, we believe that our government will continue to improve. And so we start asking the question, well, how can you improve on democracy? How can we improve on the government that we have right now? You start to hear whispers. We've made a a group of people, they meet in New York. Because we start to see, well, you know what? It would be really good if the entire world could become a democracy. It would be so great. And then we would have a global democracy. And we've begun by calling it what? Meet in New York. We call it the UN. That there's a global government. We want to have a global government. We start to hear whispers and say, wouldn't it be great if there was just one leader instead of all these different leaders across the world? Wouldn't it just be great if there was a global government, a one world government? Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't that be such an improvement on all of the governments that are going on right now? See, church, humanity believes that government is getting better and better and better. And eventually we're going to transition to a one world government and that's going to be the best government that we could have ever had. That's what humanity believes. I love what, you want to know what J. Vernon McGee says about this? I love what J. Vernon McGee says. He says, we feel as Americans that we have the best form of government and that we are superior people. Neither of which is true. This is what J. Vernon McGee says. He says, we believe we're the best. We have the best government. We're the best people. And J. Vernon McGee says, neither of which is true. Why does J. Vernon McGee say that? Because the Bible is very clear. If you read this dream and you read the interpretation, the Bible is very clear that the pinnacle of human government on this planet, according to God, was Babylon. It was the pinnacle. It was the best human government was ever going to be on this planet. That was it. Ever since then, do you notice the word that he uses? It's an inferior government that arises next. An inferior government arises, the Medes and the Persians, and it slowly deteriorates. Government, according to God, goes downhill, not uphill. And what humanity believes is the best form of government, a one-world government, God says is going to be the absolute worst form of government that's ever been on the face of this planet. What we believe is the best, God says, is the worst. Do you notice what your chart says? It's, you have to turn it sideways. It says this, Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great world colossus that pictures the deterior, deterioration of Gentile power. The image is just showing us that our governments are deteriorating. Deterioration of Gentile power. Everything is going downhill. The Bible's clear. That the governments are going downhill. 
And one day, the governments will get together, ten leaders will get together, and will give their authority to the Antichrist for a one world kingdom. And it's going to be destroyed by the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is what is going to remain forever. And so the question has to be, how do we respond to the facts of the Bible? How do we respond to the, these things that we see, that God is in control? And while humanity believes that our governments are getting better and we're becoming more superior, the Bible says very clearly the opposite. You're deteriorating. And soon you're going to deteriorate into a one-world government that brings in the Antichrist. The worst government that this world will ever see. How do we respond? Notice how King Nebuchadnezzar responds. Verse 46, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries. For you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't get everything right. He worships Daniel, the messenger. But I think it's interesting because he acknowledged that God is greater than his gods. That he is a, what does he say, a revealer of mysteries. I mean, he didn't turn to the Lord in one day. It took years for King Nebuchadnezzar to turn to the Lord. But what did Daniel do? He patiently endured evil He patiently endured with the king. He walked in humility, prudence, and discretion. He did what God had called him to do, which was to be an ambassador of Christ. Church, we serve the Lord just as Daniel served the Lord. We might not see the results that we want to see today. But God is still working. God is still working even now. We serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is in control and he is faithful to keep his word. And since the Bible is true, Since the Bible is true and God is in control and tells us that human government is deteriorating. I have a question. Because there is a question that we have to ask. If human government is deteriorating and we see that and that's what the Bible says happens, then what made America great? If human government is deteriorating, if it's going downhill, If Babylon was the best, and the Medes and Persians were the second best, and then the Greeks were the third best, and then Rome was the fourth best, and we're part of the Roman, we're part of that continuation of this Roman government, what made America great? That's what it's got to be. That we were founded on God, on biblical principles. We are founded on the fear of the Lord. That's the only explanation as to what made America great. What made America a shining light in a very dark world? It was the Lord. Because we were founded on God. We were founded on biblical principles. And then we have to ask the question, therefore, if if what made America great was the fear of the Lord, therefore, what is the greatest issue facing America today? No fear of God. Do we see it? Do we see it in our society? Do we see a decline in the fear of the Lord to having no fear of the Lord? How? Molech, abortion. How many million, millions in in just our country? What does the Lord say about the blood of Abel? He says, it cries out to me from the ground. What what does the Lord say as, as Israel is about to enter the land? He says, do not worship their gods. Do not offer your children to Molech or the land will what? He says very specifically, the land will vomit you out. How else? Haven't we taken God out of schools? Haven't we taken God out of our courts? Can't even put the Ten Commandments in your courtroom anymore. We've taken God out of our government. Is there an area where we haven't taken God out? Through this pandemic, we've tried to, our government has tried to close down churches. And whether you, whatever you believe on, on whatever side of that argument that you fall on, to not have 
meetings and fellowshipping together for over a year, there's something wrong. There's, there's something is strange is going on. We've lost the fear of the Lord in our country. What made America... And, and so when, when we have guys that say, make America great again, we'll close our borders, we'll make more jobs, and we'll do, all that is great stuff. But none of that will make America great. There's only one thing that will make America great. The only issue that's facing our country, the greatest issue that's facing our country, is that we've lost the fear of the Lord. It's the only thing that made America great. We've lost it. And if we've lost it, then we have to ask the question, can we get it back? And if so, how? We have to believe that we can get it back. I have to go look at Israel's history. And I see that even after terrible kings in Israel's history, there's still times where God brings revival to the land. They get it back. God brings revival. And so how do we get it back? We have to be the ones that say, it begins with me. I need to repent. I need to return. I need to stop falling for the deception of the enemy. And what is the biggest deception that the enemy is playing on us right now? I think the biggest deception that the enemy is playing upon the church right now is that America is our homeland. And therefore we have to do everything in our power to change America. When you, when you go out into the world today and you ask somebody, what do you think, what, what, would, be, uh, what would be your, your thought of somebody who claims to be a Christian? Who do they, who do they follow? I, I, I encourage you, maybe when you're out today, if you see somebody, just say, hey, can I ask you a question? If I say, there's a Christian over there, who would you tell me that that person's following? If they answer anything but Jesus Christ, the church has done something wrong. The church has done something wrong. If a stranger on the street would look at you and say, well, a Christian is somebody that follows the Republican Party. Oh my. We've done something wrong. If there's somebody on the street that says, well, a Christian is somebody that follows Trump. Oh my. There's something wrong. Because as Christians, we should be known for being, what does the word Christian mean, church? like Christ that's what it means anybody in the world should be able to say it wasn't the church that gave themselves the name Christian it was the world why did they give them that name they said those guys follow Christ there's something different about those guys and I look at the church in America today and I start to wonder what's the greatest issue facing according to the church what's the greatest issue facing our country And if it's not that we've lost the fear of the Lord, we're in trouble. Because as the church, we have to be in unity about this. Why? Because the Bible tells us what's going to happen. We of all people understand what's going to happen. We have to be like Daniel. We have to have contact with the world and not be under deception of the enemy and have no uh, contamination coming in upon us. Our king is God and our country is heaven. Yes, I'm proud to be an American. Yes, I want to see change happen in this country, but I understand it's not going to be in electing the right people. It's going to be in individuals returning to the Lord. Church, we have to be like Daniel. We have to pray. Daniel was a man of prayer. And what do we need to pray for? We need to pray, Lord, revive us. Because it's going to have to begin with the church. The church has to regain its witness to the world that we're followers of Christ. I follow Jesus. Wherever Jesus is going, that's where I want to be. Not anybody else. As much as I can identify with certain individuals or certain views, I follow Jesus. That's why I loved um, Tony Evans. He said, when I go into that voting booth, I am a citizen of heaven. J. Vernon McGee says, I never voted once for somebody who who I absolutely loved. I always voted against the other candidate. Because none of the people that I vote for are Jesus. And that's who I follow. This is McGee. I loved it. We have to pray. Lord, revive me. Me. So that I can set the example. Where? Church, where does it begin? I tell you every week, it begins in your home. 
If it doesn't happen in your home, if you living an authentic Christian life cannot happen in your home, it's not going to happen outside. All that you're doing outside is putting on a show. If it's not happening in your home, with your brothers and sisters, with your parents, with your kids, with whoever's there with you. If it cannot happen there, it won't happen anywhere. We have to pray for revival. We have to remember our purpose is to serve the Lord with joy, being what we are. What are we? What are we? The Bible is clear. You are an ambassador. You are a child of God. You are an ambassador of Christ. You're to be the one that pleads that Jesus pleads through you to be reconciled to God. Trust the Lord to work in you because the Lord wants to work in you. Trust the Lord to work through you to impact others for the kingdom of heaven. And I'll leave you with this quote from Wearsby. Just, he said it so much better than I ever could. As we consider these truths, our response ought to be one of joyful confidence, knowing that the Lord has everything under control and will one day reign on this earth. Well, God's people should do everything they can to alleviate suffering and make this a safer and happier world. Our hope is not in laws. Our hope is not in political alliances. Our hope is not in moral crusades. Our hope is in the Lord. Our hope is in the Lord. People's hearts need to be changed by the grace of God. And that means God's people must be witnesses to the ends of the earth. The only kingdom that will stand forever is Christ's kingdom. And the only people who will be citizens of that kingdom are those who have trusted him and been born again by the Spirit of God. Church, you are a witness. And not only a witness, but you're an example that God saves sinners. He saved you. You are an example that God died for you, that his blood that was shed on the cross has the power to change a life because it changed yours. It changed mine. And God is so faithful. He loves us so much. He died for us and he wants to faithfully lead us. He wants to use us in a powerful way. So this morning, I have James coming up. We're going to take communion together because church, we have to remember the faithfulness of the Lord. We have to focus on Jesus. And so, Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us the example of what you're going to do in the end times. Lord, help us to be looking for your soon return. And Lord, we thank you for your great faithfulness. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your blood that was shed for us. And so, Lord, as we have communion together, use James' testimony. Use this time, Lord, to speak to our hearts. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can give you this? Morning. When uh, Eli asked me to share a testimony, something in my life where the Lord has, you know, came through and rescued me, delivered me, helped me, um, there's just so many. I had a really <laughs> hard time deciding which one I wanted to share. In Psalms 34, 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord the Lord delivers them out of them all. And uh, I'm sure you folks have had many as well. So I thought really hard. And again, there all these things are in my mind trying to decide which one I want to share. And uh, I, I believe this is the one. I believe this is the one that uh, the Lord wanted me to share with you folks. Kind of goes back with what Eli shared with us a few weeks ago. And that is that we are to be lights. You know, we shouldn't be fighting and bickering, but we should be lights and we should let our lights shine. So uh, this is it. Uh, A few years ago, my sister-in-law asked me to share at my brother-in-law's memorial service. And uh, his name was Alika. And I I didn't know Alika that well. Um, You know, he, he was a nice person. Um, you know, he came to our church once and he, when he was going through a hard time, he actually accepted the Lord. Uh, Pastor Rick led him to the Lord. And that was my predicament. He, he never really bore much fruit 
You know, he never carried a Bible. He never uh, went to church. He never spoke to me about the Lord. Uh, once when I tried to, I got a little pushback from him. Um, during about the same time he accepted the Lord, he uh, got heavily involved in Hawaii, the Hawaiian culture, Hawaii Ana. And uh, he would always talk to me about, you know, going to the Turtle Patch. He'd come to my house and he'd be built, building, you know, a poi pounder and, uh, you know, other Hawaiian things. It became his identity and he was kind of consumed with it. And, uh, you know, it was great, you know, that he had that. But uh, I was just a little, you know, divided or, um, you know, just didn't know whether I should you know, go to his service and, you know, share the word. For for one thing, I never even met any of his friends or his family. I knew his mom was a Jehovah Witness. You know, I knew he was heavily involved in the Hawaiian culture. So, uh, you know, I think there was a, a lot of spiritual warfare and the fear of man. And I really, you know, told myself that I didn't want to be insensitive you know, I didn't want to uh, upset anyone. I didn't want to offend anyone. Nobody told me to share the gospel or preach the gospel. They just told me to share something about Alika. And um, what made matters worse was, you know, he, his service was held deep in, in a valley. And it was held something like this, except it was a hollet. It was a Hawaiian house with a thatched roof. And there were three men there, and they were singing Hawaiian music. And they were big, you know. They, they were like, I don't know, six foot three. And as big as they were tall, they were wide. And they weren't fat. They were just big, you know, Hawaiian men. And they didn't have pleasant happy faces <laughs> they look rugged and uh, you know I work in construction and I've been visited by some union reps you know say from the uh, heavy machinery or you know that, that kind of a thing and they're, they're not happy you know they're, they're there to intimidate you and uh, I was intimidated by the whole setting by everything that was happening there I went there a little early, but as the place started to fill up, I noticed I don't know anybody. <laughs> and, and there was a real heaviness, kind of an, a feeling of oppression. I don't know if you guys ever been to a Buddhist funeral, but mm. half of my family, they're all Buddhists. And um, I always get this feeling when I go there, you know, you smell incense and they ring the, you know, the gongs. And uh, you look on the walls and there are actually faces and figures of, I mean, I would call them demons. They have horns and they're red and they have eyes and, you know, it's really scary and oppressive and I was getting that same feeling. Nobody was fellowshipping like, you know, in our Christian services where sometimes you got to catch yourself and, you know, there are celebrations. We celebrate that our loved ones, our friends, they're no longer with us. They've graduated yeah. and they're in heaven. And, um, you know, like I was saying, sometimes I got to catch myself and say, hey, you cannot celebrate that much. You know, <laughs> I, I see my friends there and I'm talking to Eli or I'm talking to Phil, you know, and, and having not a good time, but it is a celebration. But there, it was nothing like that at this service. And, uh, you know, I was battling and struggling. I spoke with my wife, Fran, about it. And it was like, should I share? And, um, you know, I finally had to take it to the Lord. And a lot of my battling and a lot of my praying happens in the bathroom. So I went to the bathroom and I was like, Lord, you know, am I supposed to share here, Lord? I, I don't want to hurt, you know, his mom's feelings. They're having a difficult time, you know, enough as it is. And, um, you know, again, it just came back to me, the, the fear of man. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? Alika accepted Jesus Christ in my church and I'm going to share that so you know I went into my chair and I sat and uh, you know it came to my time to speak and I stood up there 
And I did have a lot of nice things to say about Alika. He was a really nice person. He was like Mr. Aloha. And uh, he loved children. Whenever he would come to my house, he'd always bring a toy. And he would go outside and he'd be playing with my kids. And he, he wouldn't talk too much with me. He felt more comfortable with the children. And I remember this one time, one of his airplanes went on my neighbor's roof. And uh, he came in the house and asked me if I could help him get it. So I jumped on our wall and I jumped across the wall onto the neighbor's house and I got the airplane. And he was telling me, you know, like a child, he would say, I would never do that. Man, that's scary, you know. And um, when Alika had his children, he loved his children. I mean, his life was fulfilled when he had his children because he was so much like a child. The other thing I shared about Alika was he loved to cook and he was a really good cook. And when he came to my house, he would make some really good dishes. I remember he made this uh, one meal. It was chicken nishime. And I said, man, Alika, how did you learn how to make this chicken nishime? It's so good. And he said, my mom taught it to me. And, um, and then it came the time when I had to say that Alika came to my church and accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I didn't mention this yet, but Alika was only 30 years old. Wow. He was only 30, and the children that he loved, they were just babies. And uh, it was kind of a you know, poignant moment where you know, I really felt the Lord share that none of us are promised tomorrow. Yeah. You know, we've got to live our lives, you know, today for the Lord. And I shared that, you know, my hope is that I will see Alika in heaven because he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Amen. And, um, you know, I finished up. And when I walked back to my chair, I, I didn't make eye contact with anybody. <laughs> you know, I just sat down. Our daughters, Naomi and Abigail, sang uh, Amazing Grace. And, um, you know, I, I was feeling a little relieved that, you know, I, I let my light shine. Yeah. And then the three Hawaiian men stood up, and they were big. And again, they, they didn't look like happy people. But they said, what? Aliga accepted the Lord? Well, all right then. And they started to sing Majesty. I, I don't know if you know that song, but it's by Jack Hayford. And it's a majestic song. And they sounded like they were the three tenors. The whole place renowned with majesty, worship, you know, Jesus Christ. And I, I have to say, it was like the strangest thing that oppressed that very quiet, yeah. you know, that very spirit of heaviness was, was just lifted. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody started to talk with each other. And, um, you know, it was, it really was a celebration. And uh, I, I'm here today because I do want to encourage all of us, like Eli was, that we should let our sh light shine. Yeah. You know, we want to be sensitive. We want to be skillful. You know, we want to be like doves. But we have to be wise, and we want to let our light shine. Yeah. And when we do, we can make a difference in our world. So let your light shine. We're in the book of Daniel. I'm a Sunday school teacher. Dare to be a Daniel. Yeah. Okay, um, Jim is going to lead us in a special song. And if I can have the ushers come forward and pass out the elements. In the book of Luke, it says, And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which has been given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And whenever I read or hear this passage, I think about, you know, wh why would he say that? Jesus, he, he doesn't need to be remembered. All the heavens speak of his glory. Even when the atheist and the agnostic sign a document, a check, a report, they pay homage to Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, the savior of the world, you know, it's nine. It's uh, 2021, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. So, when I think about it, I have to think that He only asks us to remember Him because 
it's for our benefit. Yeah. And a lot of times, you know, we're afraid, and um, you know, we're afraid to face the challenge because, like Jim mentioned today, I got to turn my page. <laughs> Jehovah Shoma, God, who is near. Yeah. And. Um, you know, I think of that song, such a beautiful song. It says that you dance over me and I'm yeah. unaware. Yeah. You sing all around and I never hear a sound. Hmm. And, um, you know, I think that we need to remember that God never will leave or forsake us. When I first got saved, there was a song that used to always be in my mind. And the song went something like, you were there all along. Yeah. Just like a song, somewhere in the back of my mind, they're all along leading me on. Now my eyes can see you standing there waiting to set me free. And that was such a game changer, you know, before I accepted the Lord. Uh, I was just so incomplete. Yeah. You know, on the outside, you know, people might have thought I was all together. But uh, on the inside, I was just a mess. And um, when we take... You know, this communion this morning, remember Jesus, that he is with us. So let's take the bread. Verse 20, it says, Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This is the cup. The new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And, um, you know, I always remember that Jesus was thankful that he was able to do this. Whenever I am accused falsely, whenever, you know, somebody makes an accusation against me, I always have to defend myself. And most of the time I even get angry. And... You know, Jesus, our example, he was nothing like that. You know, he was accused. I mean, out of anyone in the entire world who ever li lived, he was perfect. I mean, I'm never perfect. And yet, he never fought. He never argued. He never got angry. He was thankful. And um, he did it for us. He shed his blood for us. So we, we can remember that as well. Let's drink the wine or the juice. All right, as I wrap up, again, I just want to encourage everyone like Eli did that we do, this is a dark time. These are very difficult, strange times. And uh, we don't want to fight. We don't want to defend ourselves or our, or our positions. We want to be a light for Jesus so that the world might be saved. Thank you. Oh, man. I was uh, Carolina posted on the um, on Facebook that J Uncle James has the best stories about sharing <laughs> sharing your faith. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, we've got to we've got to share our faith. What we're going to do. We're going to end a little different today. We're going to go a little bit, a little bit different. God's given us this property, and we're in that place where you know we're just encouraged that we have to pray for God's will to be done, not only in our our lives. I mean, it's important for God's will to be done in us as individuals. That's where it begins. But we also need to pray that God's will will be done in us as a body of believers. Calvary Chapel, Milawani. And so the first Sunday of every month, we're going to have communion. And after communion, for those of you that that feel up to it, some of you might not feel up to it. It's okay. We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna walk over to the trees, or we're gonna walk down to the sidewalk, and down over to this corner, and right back up to this tent. And we're just gonna pray quietly, kind of like Israel marching around Jericho. <laughs> we're just gonna walk, and I'll lead us. And Pastor Clay, if you can bring up the rear. And we're just going to walk slowly around this property, and we're just going to spend the next five, how long do you think it's going to take to walk around this property? Ten minutes? Eight minutes. Phil eight. says eight minutes. Eight. So we're going we're gonna to spend, can you spend eight minutes in prayer? Can you spend eight, eight minutes in prayer? Just walk as families. If you can't, if you can't make it around the property, it, 
I don't want it is you, there are holes in the yes. ground and it's uneven ground if you can't make it to the property uh, pray in your chair or if you'd like to walk to the trees Pastor Rick and Elmer are back there Pastor Rick is looking way better after all that rain <laughs> thank you Diane for our trees back there you know walk to the trees and then walk back and, and when we come back here Jim's going to lead us in a last song and, and that will be how we end this the first Sunday of every month we're going to pray as a church and pray for the property but really pray for God's will to be done in us as a church. Like like James just encouraged us that we as a church will be light in this community that, that God has placed us in and that God's will will be done with us corporately as a church. And so if you'll just join me, we're just going to, we're just going to do a, we, our, our prayer march. Yeah. Facebook. Goodbye, Facebook. We love you guys. <laughs> we're not taking with you pray at home. Facebook. Um, but we will see we will see you guys on Monday, ten AM. But with us that are here, we're just we'll march around and we'll come back and, and we'll close with the song. Make sure that you guys visit that table. For those of you that weren't here at the beginning, there's a table right here with the ushers. After before you leave, it's gonna take you sixty seconds. I cannot say what you're supposed to do on that table. Are, are we off? Wait, 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 wait. We're not off. Bye, okay, guys. turn off. <laughs>